Quantum mechanics is the very basis of physics. With quantum mechanics, one can understand atoms, how atoms join up with other atoms to form molecules, what's inside the atom, the nucleus, the nucleus which is made up of neutrons and protons, and those neutrons and protons are themselves made up of quarks. And maybe we will understand someday, using quantum mechanics, what those quarks are themselves made up of, and they are most probably superstrings. So that's at one level. On the other level is astronomical phenomena, neutron stars, what goes on inside every kind of star, in, including our sun, and at an even bigger scale, we can understand galaxies. And then the universe and its very early stages, all this with the help of quantum mechanics. And today, quantum mechanics is still relevant. It may be responsible and is most probably responsible for the rapid expansion of our universe through something called dark energy. Now, quantum mechanics has got so many different aspects to it. And therefore, it's a very, very expansive subject. It's therefore not easy to teach. You can teach one part of it and miss out on the other parts. Now, very recently, there has come, there's been published a very interesting book. I'll put it before you. It's titled Quantum Mechanics for Beginners by Muhammad Sohail Zuberi. Sohail Zuberi is the university distinguished professor in the Department of Physics at Texas A&M University. And he's made a big name for himself in the field of quantum optics, quantum communication, and today we're going to talk to him. Welcome, Sohel. Thank you very much, Pervez. It's, it's nice to be part of this program. And we are meeting after 20 years. That's true. Time flies. So I have to tell you um, about uh, Sohel. He and I were colleagues at Qaidi Azam University. Some uh, a long time ago, Sohail left for the United States about 20, 22 years ago. And since then, he's been at various places, but now as at Texas A&M, and now, as I said earlier, an authority in his field. This book that he's written is uh, remarkable because, as you can see from the table of contents, it covers a huge spectrum of, uh, of new ideas or I should say, rather, old ideas which have become new. So now I'm going to ask uh, Sohail to tell us, to give us um, in a snapshot, in, in five minutes maybe, how quantum mechanics, how thinking about quantum mechanics has changed from the very inception, from the days of Schrodinger and onwards. Okay, uh, um, well, uh, quantum mechanics, as uh, we know, uh, uh, the foundations were developed in the first quarter of the 20th century. It was done in two stages. In the first stage, which has started in, as a matter of fact, in, at the turn, literally at the turn of the century, uh, uh, 1899, through the work of Max Planck. Max Planck was trying to explain uh, a very commonly observed phenomenon uh, uh, when we heat an object, uh, we observe that its color changes. Uh, this was something which was known for a long time. Uh, what, what was not known was what is the mechanism and how one could uh, understand uh, this phenomenon. Max Planck, uh, in a, a very desperate attempt, explained this phenomenon by assuming that energy consists of, of packets. There are packets of energies. It's not like all possible energies are allowed. So this quantization of energy, that was the beginning of uh, quantum mechanics. Then uh, came uh, Albert Einstein, who, who introduced the concept of photon. Uh, a few years later, it was uh, Niels Bohr, who could uh, explain uh, the radiation emitted by hydrogen atom uh, by invoking uh, this Planck's hypothesis uh, and uh, got the correct results. But these were uh, these three major developments uh, in the first quarter of uh, uh, 20th century 
uh, they were based on postulates. There was no theory. And then new phenomena were coming, which could not be explained or based, based on the theory which had been developed in the last two, 300 years through the work of Newton, Maxwell, and, and many others. Uh, the breakthrough came in the summer of 1925 when Heisenberg, a 24 year old uh, scientist, German scientist, he came up with the basic ideas of a quantum mechanical theory. Parallel to him in January of 1926, uh, Schrodinger presented uh, an equation uh, uh, that bear uh, his name. Later people realized that what uh, Heisenberg and Schrodinger were talking about were the same thing. They were uh, the same theory looked from two different angles. Well, this was really a major breakthrough and now everything has started falling in place. All the phenomena that had been known until that time could be explained on the basis of this quantum theory, which was developed through the work of Heisenberg and uh, Schrodinger and Max Born and uh, Wolfgang Pauli and Paul Dirac and so on. And people started predicting new phenomena based on, on this theory, new fields are starting, uh, starting to evolve, uh, evolution like condensed matter physics, uh, nuclear physics, uh, particle physics, and so on and so on. But at that time, uh, there were some uh, people who were really very concerned about uh, the foundational issues of quantum mechanics. I mean, quantum mechanics, uh, paradoxically, is one of the most successful uh, theories uh, in the human history. Uh, even after the passage of 100 years, when the precision of measurements of temperature, distance, uh, etc., frequency, uh, uh, that has increased tremendously, there is not a single phenomenon at this time uh, which is in violation with the predictions of quantum mechanics. But the conceptual foundations of quantum mechanics uh, really were very strange. I mean, as an example, uh, when uh, Schrodinger wrote his equation uh, for what he called a uh, wave function, uh, he didn't know uh, amazingly uh, what the meaning of uh, the wave function uh, was. It was several months later that Max Born came up with the interpretation uh, that uh, it corresponded to at least the square of it corresponded to the probability of finding the uh, particle at that position. So this was, uh, and then there were underlying themes uh, that were really very counterintuitive. For example, wave particle duality. Uh, a particle can behave both as a particle, an electron can behave like an, uh, an, uh, a particle in some experiments, but it can behave like a wave in some other experiments. Similarly, Light can behave like a wave, like an in interference type experiments, but it can behave like particles also, like uh, in Einstein's uh, uh, explanation of photoelectric effect. So this, this is something which we have lived for 100 years, but this is a very counterintuitive idea. Then Heisenberg came along with uh, an uncertainty principle. I mean, our classical intuition is based on the fact that uh, if uh, we uh, if uh, a, uh, an object is moving, uh, uh, we know its position and its uh, uh, how fast it's moving at any given time, as precisely as we can. The only restriction, of course, is uh, that we have to have very good measuring instruments. What Heisenberg showed was on the basis of quantum mechanics that this is not. Possible. I mean, there is a, a, a limit uh, at some point, a limit is reached where we, we be uh, beyond which we cannot measure uh, position and how fast it's moving uh, to an arbitrary accuracy. A and uh, uh, coherent superposition. I mean, the idea that uh, an object uh, uh, can, uh, can exist in two possible states at the same time. Uh, quantum entanglement and so on. So these were the issues. Uh, and then the question of reality. Very paradoxically, people, uh, some people who had played a very key role in inventing uh, quantum mechanics, like uh, Einstein and Schrodinger and de Broglie, they were very dissatisfied with what they had created. So it was, um, it was a disagreement about certainty versus uncertainty. And this is something that Einstein was never comfortable with. Do you want to amplify on that? 
Yes. So, I mean, one uh, one most celebrated consequence of uh, uh, of uh, quantum mechanics was that uh, the concept of a trajectory, uh, the concept uh, of uh, 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 definiteness, determinism was gone. There was always associated an uncertainty and uh, uh, a probabilistic nature of measurement. So just to give a very layman example, uh, if you throw uh, a ball uh, on, a, on, a, on a wall, Newtonian mechanics tells us that we can, uh, 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 that we can find the position and how fast it's moving at a given time for all times. And we would know precisely where the ball will land on the wall if we know all the forces that are acting on it. Quantum mechanics uh, doesn't, uh, I mean, uh, when, when we go to the microscopic particles like electrons, something like this does not happen. I mean, an electron, when it is incident on, let's say a screen, uh, we only know the probability that uh, it will land at a certain place it's, uh, we, we do not have uh, a deterministic uh, trajectory or deterministic position where it will land. This was something which was very unsatisfactory uh, to some people, including Albert Einstein. I mean, Einstein was very, very uncomfortable uh, with uh, uh, the probabilistic nature of uh, uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, this uh, uh, led to a lot of discussion Especially, uh, there was there was uh, uh, a lot of debate between uh, Einstein and and Niels Bohr. I mean, there was another aspect of uh, quantum mechanics which was very which made uh, Einstein very uncomfortable, and that was this principle of complementarity uh, that was due to Niels Bohr. Uh, according to principle of uh, uh, complementarity, uh, if we consider uh, two observables. Uh, they are uh, uh, they they may be complementary if precise knowledge of one of them uh, implies that all possible outcomes for the second observable uh, are possible. So uh, let me interrupt you over here. Um, you've um, mm -hmm. told us about uh, Schrodinger and how quantum mechanics started with him. Now, if I look at your book, the last chapter is that of the Schrodinger equation, whereas normally it would come in the first chapter of a quantum mechanics book. And yet your book is, is uh, you call it as one for beginners, but it's got a, it, it's, it's, it's a very sophisticated book. There are things over here that would be quite new, very new for a lot of practitioners of quantum mechanics. So it's, yes, the mathematics is simple, it's algebra, but uh, there is one principle that you use again and again, I'd say exactly, throughout the book. Exactly. And that, that is, is when you one observe of the a system, you disturb yeah. it. Yes. I mean, that is certainly true. That, uh, that uh, I mean, we can understand uh, Heis Heisenberg uncertainty relation, which I just mentioned, on, on that basis. And, and just to understand how that comes about, how that comes about, for example, in the explanation for Heisenberg uncertainty uh, principle, uh, which means that we cannot determine the position and how fast it's moving uh, at a given time, no matter how precise our instruments are. Uh, the, the, basically, the, the question is, how do we measure an object? I mean, if I can, uh, uh, if I can uh, quote uh, Heisenberg from his paper, uh, he says, if one wants to be clear about what is meant by position of an object, for example, of an electron, then one has to specify definite experiments by which the position of an electron can be measured. Otherwise, this term has no meaning at all. Okay, what, does, what this means is that when we, when we say uh, an object uh, is located at a certain position, what does it mean? Uh, of course, we establish uh, the uh, position of an object by making some sort of a measurement. The most ordinary measurement is that light is, is scatters on to, uh, light hits that object and then it's, it is scatters into our eyes. And then we see and we determine the position of that object. But once we reach at the level of 
uh, of, uh, uh, of microscopic uh, particles, uh, light, as I mentioned, in, within the context of wave particle duality, uh, it behaves like particles and it has the same characteristics like any other particle. Uh, and that means that it can impart some sort of momentum to the particle. And that means that it disturbs uh, the, 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 the particle which we are trying to measure. So, so in, even in this very simple example, which we practice all the time, what we see is that the particle that, we, that measurement always disturbs the system. Uh, so therefore, it, uh, if we say, oh, uh, uh, an object is located at a certain point, uh, that uh, is is not no longer true, and uh, and uh, if we try to measure it very precisely, uh, then uh, the uh, moment the how fast it's moving that becomes affected, and so on. Okay, just to just to make things a little simpler for people to understand, uh, let me take an example from anthropology. So when an anthropologist is present in um, in let's say a primitive tribe. It, is, it has been noted that the people of, the, of that tribe behave differently as compared to when the anthropologist is not there. So uh, if there are three people or four people in a room and a stranger comes along, then those people in the room start behaving differently. So that is, an, that is a situation where the act of observation actually influences what is being observed. But now, Sohail, let me ask you, Mm -hmm. Do you believe in objective reality? Do you believe that the moon is there even if nobody looks at it? I know that's a famous question. Uh, what is your take on that? Well, this, this, this was a question not posed by an ordinary mortal. This was a question which was uh, posed by uh, Albert Einstein. I mean, Albert Einstein uh, uh, was, as I mentioned, concerned about the questions uh, of reality. And he had uh, a particular definition of reality. I mean, if, if I quote from, his, from the very famous EPR paper, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen paper, uh, he, he defines reality in these words. If without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty, that is with probability equal to one, uh, the value of a physical quantity, then there is an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. What this means is that if we can, uh, if there is uh, uh, an object which uh, uh, is, a, uh, it is real, if it, is, if ex it exists, uh, even without the, in, in, uh, uh, without the observation uh, of, of uh, anyone. And then he goes on to argue that every element of physical reality must have a counterpart in the physical theory. Okay, so this was really the crux of the problem that if we have reality, which means an object exists, now how do we measure the reality? How, how do we find out whether an object, whether moon is there when we don't look at it, okay? so. Uh, we are not allowed to look at it. I mean, that is Einstein's definition of reality. Well, uh, the, the, what was proposed was that, okay, we can have some correlated uh, events. For example, if we want to establish the reality of moon, we can just go to the shores uh, of, of a sea and look at the tides. And by looking at the tides, analyzing it, how, the frequency of it, the uh, how high the tides are, we can infer the existence of moon. And based upon that, uh, uh, Einstein came up with a paradox which seemed to violate uh, some foundational issues of quantum mechanics like uh, uh, Bohr's principle of complementarity. So this was really a uh, very uh, uh, important uh, milestone in the development of, the, of quantum mechanics this idea that uh, reality and locality, they do not uh, uh, simultaneously uh, uh, exist. Well, uh, Bohr's point of view was somewhat different. Uh, he, he uh, and, and the point of view which has come uh, to be known, uh, to, to be established uh, in the established quantum mechanics. 
And that uh, idea was that uh, reality has to be associated with measurement. Yeah, but it, um, it, when, when you say that something has to be measured, the question is who will measure it and whether consciousness then intrudes into the making of a reality. So um, does it matter that I observe it or you observe it or an ant or a mouse observes it or even a virus? Does it have to be consciousness which makes measurement? Well, this was the point of view of Albert Einstein uh, that objects exist independent of human uh, observance or, or uh, directly or indirectly. <clears throat> uh, however, uh, and Einstein, uh, along with his colleagues uh, Podolsky and Rosen, came up with some paradoxes uh, based on this concept of reality. Well, 1935 was the year when uh, things were changing, political uh, climate was changing in Europe. Uh, Hitler had come to power. And uh, many of these people who were involved in this uh, debate on the fundamental issues like Einstein, Schrodinger, uh, and uh, others, Max Born, uh, they had to leave their positions, they lost their jobs, etc. And then Second World War. When uh, we came out of the Second World War, the emphasis had, had shifted towards, uh, towards more practical, solving more practical problems. Uh, and these foundational issues were almost forgotten. A revival of this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, fundamental issues came with the work in 1964 by John Bell. He, he derived uh, inequalities which were based essentially on these, these two premises, locality and reality. Locality means no influence moves faster than the speed of light. This is uh, uh, something which uh, is established by Einstein's theory of relativity <laughs> and a violation of uh, this uh, of this principle uh, could lead to again a uh, number of paradoxes. The foundations of quantum mechanics are still being debated. There's still the question of whether the observer and what is being observed have to be in the same, ha have to be uh, in a quantum state, a pure quantum state. And this then makes um, open the question of whether different observers will see different things because it's, it's a complicated discussion, but the point is that the foundations of quantum mechanics are still um, not completely settled. Would you agree on that? Oh, yes, yes, of course. I mean, these, these notions that I talked about, uh, uh, which lie at the foundations of quantum mechanics, there is no cl uh, clear uh, resolution, but there is a general consensus about different, the interpretations. Of course, uh, some people still feel unhappy about it and, uh, and uh, there is uh, still discussion going on. But I mean, the amazing thing is that these, uh, these uh, simple concepts uh, could, could be used to do some big things. And uh, here in the book, I talk about, uh, uh, I devote uh, quite uh, several chapters to a discussion of uh, uh, quantum communication and quantum computing. I mean, these two areas, they do not depend upon uh, the conventional route that you mentioned via Schrodinger equation. You don't need to know Schrodinger equation to understand uh, how one can achieve a perfectly secure uh, uh, communication uh, between, uh, 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 between two uh, persons. Uh, and similarly, quantum computing, which can solve some problems at amazingly fast speed, could be done using quantum mechanics, employing concepts like coherent superposition and quantum entanglement. So this is a remarkable development of last uh, 30 or 40 years, uh, which owes itself to these, uh, these debates that took place as far as the uh, conceptual foundations uh, are concerned. Now, you mentioned that I, I talk about Schrodinger equation at the end of the book. So let me mention my intention of this book. 
this book, uh, basically, I wanted to, to write for uh, people uh, who have very little mathematical background. As a matter of fact, I don't assume any calculus. I dwell upon these conceptual foundations, these issues, uh, the, the, the einstein board debate uh, in quite details. Uh, but then uh, I use uh, very simple-minded mathematics to discuss how, for example, uh, a perfectly secure uh, communication can take, uh, can take place and uh, how this quantum comp computation works. Yeah, obviously you can't tell us uh, in, in just one short interview how quantum computers work and what secure how secure communication works. But um, some quick questions. Quantum computing is an idea that goes back to Richard Feynman and there has been some development. What is the state of quantum computation today? Well, quantum computer, okay, first of all, let me mention why quantum computing and why, and why it was so problematic that it took such a long time, okay? So in order to understand that, let me give you a very, uh, start with a very simple example. If you have a window, it has, uh, it, it can be either open or shut. Okay? If you have two windows, we have four possibilities. Both of both windows could be open. The first one could be open, the second one closed. The first one is closed, the second one is open, and both of them are open, okay? If you have three windows, there are eight possibilities. So two, two multiplied by two multiplied by two. If there are 1000 uh, windows, uh, then it would be two uh, uh, multiplied by two 1000 times, which is a very, very large number. Now, in the case of a window, one of these possibilities will be there. Either all 1000 uh, windows will be closed or uh, half of them will be open and half of them will be closed, etc. Quantum mechanics, uh, as I mentioned, has uh, this, uh, these, uh, uh, these possibilities of coherent superposition and entanglement. What that means is, that all these for, for, for an atom. So now from windows, let's go to some quantum objects like an atom. So supposing an atom can exist in two possible states. Let's call uh, one state to be the ground state and one to be excited state. So the atom uh, could be in the ground state or in the excited state. If there are two atoms, uh, there are these four possibilities, both of them in the ground state and, and so on, so on. <clears throat> if we have thousand atoms, then we have the two raised power uh, 1000 possibilities. The, the, the magical thing about quantum mechanics is that all these possible states can simultaneously exist. So, uh, I mean, instead of one by one, they can exist simultaneously. What that means is that if I can have just 1000 atoms, I can manipulate two raised power 1000 numbers. Now this number may not, you may not appreciate how large it is until we realize that this is larger than the number of protons in the entire universe. So in some sense, we are solving a problem through quantum entanglement, what would require on a conventional computer, every single atom in the entire universe. So this is the power of quantum computing. So now obviously the question is, if it is so simple, why there is no quantum computer today? Why it has taken such a long time to come up with this idea? Well, uh, there are two issues which uh, limit uh, uh, the, uh, the application of this idea uh, in a very straightforward manner. The first one, which is much more fundamental is this probabilistic nature. So you can have a superposition of all these uh, large number of possibilities, but when you try to measure then you find atoms in either in the ground state or excited state. And that result is not deterministic, that is probabilistic. We can just calculate the probability that, uh, that uh, a certain outcome will be there. But that means is that we will have a quantum computer whose outcome eventually will be probabilistic. 
that is not computa computation okay the second aspect which really is very challenging uh, is uh, what we call decoherence in the sense that in quantum mechanics unlike a classical mechanics uh, there are these inherent fundamental fluctuations uh, that we cannot uh, avoid uh, and uh, for a realization of a quantum computer we have to somehow overcome uh, this uh, decoherence uh, uh, effects well the technical problems are very difficult uh, surely um, they they will be overcome in gradual steps but uh, sohel as of 2021 where does quantum computation stand has there been any tangible progress in terms of the technology uh, are we going to see a desktop <laughs> quantum computer? I don't think so, but what's your guess? Um, when are we go actually going to see these uh, physical computers? Okay, so based on what I just said, uh, what seems to be clear is that at least in the foreseeable future, we will not have an all-purpose computer, like the computer uh, that we use every day these days. Uh, a quantum computer will basically uh, be uh, useful to solve a particular problem. For example, the field of quantum computing uh, really took off when in 1995, it was proposed that a quantum computer could, uh, could factorize uh, a number into its prime factors. Okay, now this looks like a very mundane problem uh, of mathematics number theory, that if you have a number which is a product of two primes, uh, finding out the prime factors. This problem, as a matter of fact, uh, lies uh, uh, at the foundations of uh, the uh, communication safety uh, for e-commerce and uh, any, uh, you know, I mean, today's uh, uh, communication uh, protocols. So it's a very practical problem. But this, this problem, I mean, this factorization now can be achieved in principle by using a quantum computer with very limited resources. The, 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 the factorization, for example, of a thousand digit number would require on the fastest computer available today, uh, the age of the universe, which is something like uh, 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 13 uh, million, uh, 13 to 14 million years. But on using a quantum computer, it could be done in few million steps. I mean, this is something which I've tried to explain uh, at a, uh, with very simple mathematics in, 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 in the book. Yeah, Sohail, we are running out of time. Uh, but flipping through your book, there is one chapter which is very intriguing, and that's quantum communication with invisible photons. Can you just explain that in one minute? Okay, as a matter of fact, this topic is, uh, is uh, really very favorite to mine because me and my uh, colleagues uh, 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 came up with this idea. So the basic idea is this, that uh, any communication system that we have known to this date, they require some kind of a, uh, carriers. So for example, when we are speaking to each other, the molecules, uh, they are basically moved from uh, one person to another. Uh, in our ordinary con communication fiber optics cables is the photons. Uh, 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 the notion that we can communicate uh, without any medium whatsoever in between, this is a highly counterintuitive, but somehow we could use uh, in a, a 1913 paper, we could use some very simple properties of uh, uh, beam splitters using single photons a protocol where we could communicate with each other or send information from uh, one to, uh, to the other uh, uh, with absolutely nothing in between the sender and the receiver. I mean, this is a topic which generated a lot of controversy, but now I, almost everybody believes that this is true. Experiments have been done uh, uh, to, to verify these predictions. Ah. You know, what, what you say is very intriguing. You say there's nothing in between, but there is the vacuum, and the vacuum is itself a quantum system. And uh, so if you disturb one part of the vacuum, another part 
gets disturbed because they're all it's it's in one quantum state okay uh, yeah i mean of course in the quantum analysis we have to treat uh, vacuum respectfully uh, but uh, the the sense in which there is nothing in there is that uh, uh, that there is no photon no at no electron no uh, molecules uh, in the communication system so it is uh, counterintuitive in that respect yes of course the vacuum is there and it has its own properties yes good that's a great piece of work and it's really been fun talking to you i hope your book does very well <laughs>